ಓಸುದೇವಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣುರಮರ್ದನ ದೇವಕಿ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು so we are on the 11th chapter um of the bhagavad gita and uh, we have been seeing in this chapter how in response to um arjuna's prayer that i would like to have this vision of the cosmic form of god i do believe that you are an incarnation of god he says to krishna and then in response to his prayer krishna grants him that extraordinary vision so the 11th chapter is vishwarupa darshana the vision of krishna of god in its in god's cosmic form as this universe one might say but we are seeing this universe yes we are seeing it as an object as a material universe we are not seeing it as the body of god you yeah. know like i see you as a person can i see this universe itself as one person so that is uh, in vedanta that is called virat the vast or vishwarupa the cosmic form so that that vision uh, arjuna wanted it he was get granted that by krishna and the results were not good he was scared out of his wits so we see how uh, t- tremendous poetry this 11th chapter is awesome for its poetry and i mentioned how openheimer actually quoted from this 11th chapter when he saw the first the atom bomb explosion um arjuna responds with first with fear and terror at what he is seeing and then he's overwhelmed it's, it's an overwhelming experience i mean it's uh, what americans would call mind blowing <laughs> but he is also ecstatic his uh, uh, f- heart is full of uh, of awe and reverence and love and uh, then he prays that i want to see you in your human form again so that's where we stopped last time now i'll go through this uh, next few verses quickly one thing about the 11th chapter is that this chapter doesn't have much by the way of teaching not much by the way of philosophy it's uh, the poets attempt to depict a stunning mystical experience so at the end of the chapter however the last verse of this chapter is a gem so i hope to race through the remaining verses and come to the last verse which is the point of not only this class but of the whole 11th chapter and not only the whole 11th chapter as we shall see number of commentators they say it is the point of the whole bhagavad gita the last verse of the 11th chapter but first let's go through verses 47 onwards verse number 47 shri bhagavan uvacha shri bhagavan uvacha maya prasannena tavarjunidam maya prasannena tavarjunidam rupam param darshitam atmayogat rupam param darshitam atmayogat ತೇಜೋಮಯ ವಿಶ್ವಮನಂತಮಾದ್ಯ ತೇಜೋಮಯ ವಿಶ್ವಮನಂತಮಾದ್ಯ ಯನ್ಮೇ ತ್ವನ್ಯೇನ ನ ದೃಷ್ಟಪೂರ್ವ ಯನ್ಮೇ ತ್ವನ್ಯೇನ ದೃಷ್ಟಪೂರ್ವ ದ ಪ್ಲೆಸಡ್ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ಸೆಡ್ ಬೀಯಿಂಗ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಶೋನ್ ಯು ಓ ಅರ್ಜುನ ಥ್ರೂ ಮೈ ಯೋಗ ಪಾವರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ರಿಸ್ಪ್ಲೆಂಡೆಂಟ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಲ್ infinite and primeval which has not been seen by any anyone else than you this not been seen by anyone else other than you uh, the commentator here i'm i'm using the commentator by shridhar swami but uh, multiple commentaries are there the commentator here said twadanyena um twadrisha twadrishat bhaktadanyena so other than devotees like you so the others others have seen this but you have to be a devotee you have to be a spiritual seeker to get this experience one more point here universal form what exactly did he see here um the commentator says vishwam 
విశ్వాత్మకం అనంతం సో విశ్వాత్మకం కాన్షియస్నెస్ అసోసియేటెడ్ విత్ దిస్ ఎంటైర్ యూనివర్స్ జస్ట్ యాజ్ ఐ ఆర్ యూ వీ ఆర్ కాన్షియస్నెస్ అసోసియేటెడ్ విత్ వన్ బాడీ అండ్ మైండ్ ఇమాజిన్ కాన్షియస్నెస్ అసోసియేటెడ్ విత్ ద ఎంటైర్ యూనివర్స్ and if that could be experienced by a person that's go that was the experience then sri krishna goes on number 48 na veda yagya dhyane irna dane na veda yagya dhyane irna dane na cha kriya bhirna tapo bhirugrai న క్రియాభిర్న తపోభిరుగ్రైవంశక్యహం నృలోకేవంశక్యహం నృలోకే ద్రష్టుం త్వదన్యన కురు ప్రవీర ద్రష్టుం త్వదన్యన కురు ప్రవీర నీదర్ బై అ స్టడీ ఆఫ్ ద వేదర్స్ అండ్ సాక్రిఫైసెస్ nor by charity nor by ceremonies nor by austere penances can i be seen in this form in the world of mortals by any other person than you o great hero among the kurus so basically he is saying saying that it's almost impossible by one's own own efforts to get this vision it is by the grace of god alone that one can get this vision in fact just as a point even upon enlightenment upon god realization whatever counts as god realization enlightenment one sign of a mature enlightenment would be that uh, upon attaining it one realizes there was no real causal link between the preceding efforts and that realization it's not that i caused it by all these practices that i had done they might have helped but really what happened came from somewhere else it seemed entirely um adventitious or entirely a product of grace here also he says this amazing experience is due to grace now what about his prayer that i'm scared i want to see your the um, the, the form with which i am familiar the form of krishna as a human being i want to see that i don't want to see this anymore 49 verse number 49 mate vyatha macha vimurdha bhavo drishtva roopam ghoram idringam edam drishtva roopam ghoram idringam edam vyapita bhi pritam anapunastvam మాచూఢవ um come out of your fear your terror come out of your stupefied you know stunned uh, this, this uh, state of mind and this form ghora roopam this terrifying or this overwhelming form i will i'm withdrawing it and it will be replaced by my human form with which you are familiar see that again once again you will see that and free from fear and filled with cheerfulness you will see that form again now the scene changes to sanjaya who is narrating all this to the blind king sanjay says now sanjay uvacha ityarjunam vasudevas tathoktva ityarjunam vasudevas tathoktva swakam roopam darshayama sabhuyah స్వకం రూపం దర్శయామాస భూయ ఆశ్వాసయామాస భీతమేనం ఆశ్వాసయామాస భీతమేనం భూత్వా పునా సౌమ్యవపూర్మహాత్మా 
भूत्वा पुनः सौम्यवपूर महात्मा संजय सेद स्पीकिंग दस टू अर्जुन वासुदेव दट इज कृष्ण अगेन शोड हिम हिज ओन फॉर्म हिज ओरिजिनल फॉर्म the great soul again cheered up the frightened arjuna assuming his benign body or the benign form then what was arjuna's reaction arjuna vacha arjuna vacha drishtvedam manusham roopam drishtvedam manusham roopam tava samyam janardana तव सौम्यम जनादन इदानीमस्म संवृत्त इदानीमस्म संवृत्त सचेता प्रकृति गचेता प्रकृति गर्जुन सेड ओ जनादन सीईंग दिस बिनाइन ह्यूमन फॉर्म ऑफ योर्स आई हैव नाउ बिकम सेल्फ कंपोज एंड हैव कम टू मैन टू नॉर्मल स्टेट notice how the meter changed uh, so the, the chant so the meter uh, changes up to now when the the tremendous form was present so you had a very sublime rousing uh, meter now it's <laughs> back to the original meter it's like more like the usual conversation shri bhagavan uvacha श्री भगवाच सुदूरदर्शम इदम रूपम सुदूरदर्शम इदम रूपम दृष्टवानसी यम दृष्टवानसी यम देवाप्यस्वाप्यस्वाप्य नित्यम दर्शन कांक्षिण nityam darshana kaankshinah the blessed lord said exceedingly difficult is it to see this form of mine that you have seen even the gods are ever eager to see this form so showing the rarity the great blessing that has been given to uh, arjuna and uh, that it is out of sheer grace that he has got this rare privilege what good did it do arjuna even if uh, i mean he got scared did he become enlightened no you will not say technically not and that's why the gita goes on um, further practices are there and so on however this much is true after this arjuna can never again question you know his uh, the reality of god this experience was so stunning no worldly experience can ever compare with it nothing that arjuna will ever experience in this world will ever come close to this and this is something um so it's stamped upon him that god is real that that he has literally seen this And then uh, krishna continues number 53 naham vedairna tapasa naham vedairna tapasa nadane na nachejaya न दान न चेजया शक्य विधो द्रष्टु शक्य विधो द्रष्टु दृष्टवानसी मथा दृष्टवानसी मथा सो नीदर बाय द वेदर्स नॉर बाय ऑस्टेरिटीज नॉर बाय गिफ्ट नॉर बाय सैक्रिफाइसिस एम आई विजिबल इन दिस फॉर्म एज यू हैव जस्ट सीन मी so this is very clear he is saying that the rarity is exceeding value of this vision and it can be given only by grace it's not by studying the vedas a lot or performing lots of rituals or by a lot of austerities by your own spiritual practices i will do this and i'll get that result i'm reminded of this monk who wrote a letter to ma sharada She, he had gone to the himalayas to rishikesh to practice austerities to meditate and so letters would be read out to the mother this monk is asking oh mother that that i have been here for months and months you know or years and begging for my food and repeating the mantra i have repeated the mantra so many thousands or hundreds of thousands of times but you know the god has not been gracious as i have not been able to get the vision of god so the mother was slightly annoyed she said write to him she dictated a letter 
She said, do you think God is like a sack of potatoes? You'll go to the market and pay the price and get it. That I have done so much practice, so much meditation, repeated mantras so many times. And therefore God has to appear before me. No. And uh, then she said, you will have the vision of God. That is a great blessing. But in God's good time. <laughs> and this, then she added one more thing. Write to him that he is a monk. If he does not call on God, what else will he do? It's, he's not doing anybody a favor by him meditating and repeating the mantra. No. Near least of all God. So it's out of God's sheer grace that one gets this uh, experience, the God experience. Number 54. So 54 and 55 are the conclusion. 54 leads up to 55, which is very, very important. Number 54. Bhaktya tu ananyaya shakya Bhaktya tu ananyaya shakya Aham evam vidhurjuna Aham evam vidhurjuna Gyatum drashtum chatatvena Gyatum drashtum chatatvena Praveshtum cha parantapa Praveshtum cha parantapa but by undivided devotion, O Arjuna, can I in this form be known and realized in truth and entered into, O scorcher of foes. So is there nothing that we can do to become enlightened? He says, no, there is. And this is one-pointed devotion. Ananya Bhakti. Remember, the theme of these six chapters from the uh, seventh chapter up to the twelfth chapter is Bhakti is devotion to God. The theme is God. So he says, by one-pointed devotion to God, by exclusive devotion to God, exclusive love of God, one can realize God. What will you get? He says, three things. Gyatum, to know. Drashtum, to see. Praveshtum, to en enter into. Um, when we say God, realization is the goal of human life. We want God realization. What is our project here? What are you trying to do? God realization, enlightenment. But what does that what does that mean actually? What happens? What are you actually actually asking for? What would you count as God realization? When is one God realized? So he says these three aspects of God realization. One is Gyatum Chatatvena to know God in truth. To know that God alone is the reality. This world is an appearance. So this has to be known. Known not by reading it. One might say, yes, I have read Vedanta, I have read Gita, I have read the Upanishad, so I know now. So I'm, am I realized, am I enlightened? No. I have read the words, but it's, it's not a fact for me. It's not a living fact for me. To know means to realize that, yes, this is God. There's nothing but God here. So that is one. One aspect of God realization. Second is, to see. Like Arjuna asked, I want to see. Not just understand or realize. I know, I understand, I believe everything is, is... Also another aspect is the actual mystical experience. The extraordinary experience. Sri Ramakrishna, somebody called him a super mystic. The extraordinary experience of, of actual experience of the Divine Mother. So when he says, I see God. You know, Vivekananda, Narendra Dutta comes to Sri Ramakrishna with his question. Sir, have you seen God? And Sri Ramakrishna answers in the affirmative. He, with the full confidence. Yes, I have seen and so can you. But Narendra also is also a skeptic. Skeptic means he is not so easily persuaded. As the philosopher David Hume said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. So if you're claiming, I've seen God, then you need really extraordinary proof. So he was skeptical of the fact that Sri Ramakrishna actually has not only seen but does see in the present sense. So Sri Ramakrishna plaintively said to him, he was like a child, he said, but she talks to me, she moves, she talks to me. And Narendra Nath said, oh, it, it happens like that, that's the very nature of hallucinations, you'll feel like that. <laughs> <laughs> so a real mystical experience of actually experiencing God. And finally, praveshtum, to enter into God, to become one with God. Uh, you know, whatever in your approach, devotional or the knowledge approach, counts as attaining God. 
What do you, what would you what would that mean for a devotee, for a person who believes in a personal God? That um, you know, God is Sri Ramakrishna for me, or Krishna or Rama, like for Arjuna, God is Krishna, incarnation. Or God is the Lord in heaven. So being in heaven in the company of God, in the presence of God, a living presence, that is attaining attaining God. The Vaishnava Vedantins have various aspects, various types of they call it Sayudya, Samipya, Salokya. Salokya means after death you go to the same abode as God. It is known variously as Brahma Loka, the abode of Brahman, or or Vaikuntha, the abode of Vishnu, or Shiva Loka, whatever. In different religions, different theistic religions, there are different names for it. Basically the highest heaven in the presence of God. That counts as attainment of God. Or the experience of oneness with God. That I am extinguished in God's uh, presence. In Samadhi, for example. Becoming one with God. Or another variation of that would be the Advaitic realization. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. All of these count as, uh, as God realization. So all three, Krishna says, all three are possible. All three will come. You will know, realize that it is all God. You will see that it is all. What, what Arjuna just saw. And you will see it uh, as a, a wonderful, nourishing, uh, vivid experience which will not scare you. And you will uh, enter into God. You will become one with God. And all of that is added to Tattvena, in reality. Know in reality means not knowing just by reading something or understanding something. Seeing in reality does not mean a hallucination or something, a genuine mystical experience. And praveshtum in, real, in reality, praveshtum means to enter into God in reality is either a dualistic, devotional uh, experience of the nearness, the proximity of God forever, the eternal heaven of devotees, or the non-dualistic the realization, I am Brahman. All three will happen. This is, this is the vision of the Vedic Rishis. What is the ultimate that this philosophy can give us? This, this whole uh, Vedic tradition. Sarvam Brahmamayam Jagat. Vasudeva Sarvamiti. In, in the words of um, Bhagavad Gita. That Vasudeva, Vishnu, Brahman is everything. There is only God and nothing else. The snake and the rope. The whole point of it is the rope is not there. The, uh, the snake is not there. The rope alone is there. The point of denying the snake is to establish that the rope alone exists. The point of saying Jagat Bithya, the falsity of the world. The point of it is not to debate about the metaphysics of falsity. There is a whole very difficult branch of Advaita Vedanta which does that. For certain reasons. But the real point is to establish the non-dual Brahman. Brahman alone exists. Very vast. Very, very. This is the last word. Swami Saradhanandaji. Once Sri Ramakrishna, pleased with Swami Saradananda, who, who became Mr. Saradananda later on, Sharat, asked him, what do you want? Blessings. And Saradananda said, I want to see Brahman in all beings. And Sri Ramakrishna said, but that's the last, uh, this is the final realization, that all is Brahman, but you will have it. He said to him, you will have it. So this is the vision, this is the Vedic vision. Now how do you do it? What can we do? And Krishna gives the answer here. Ananya Bhakti, one-pointed, exclusive uh, devotion. He says, undivided devotion, one-pointed devotion, exclusive devotion to God and God alone. How do you practice that? That is the 55th verse, which we will enter into. Um, very important verse, the commentator here in introduces, suddenly the commentator says here, Ataha Sarva Shastra Saram, Paramam Rahasyam Shrinu Ityaha. Now listen. Sharva, Sarva Shastra Saram, the essence of all scriptures. Paramam Rahasyam, the, rahasyam, the, the supreme secret, the ultimate secret. Listen to this. Shankaracharya, in his commentary on this verse, he introduces it by saying, Sarva Gita Shastra Artha Saram. Or words to that effect. The essence of the teaching of the entire Gita. 
And then he says, Shankaracharya says, Nishreshartha Nam, those who want moksha, those who want liberation, for them what is to be practiced, that's going to be an anushtana, that is going to be said here. Madhusudan Saraswati, another great non-dualist, in his magnificent uh, commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, Gurartha Deepika, the lamp of uh, profound knowledge, Gurartha Deepika, profound meaning. In that he says that the essence of the Gita is in this verse. And Punji Kritam, it is a compact, um, the, it's, the whole meaning is packed into this and it is meant for practice, he says. So, enough advertisement, enough build up. <laughs> so, what, what he's going to talk about? He's going to talk about this one pointed devotion, this exclusive devotion that one can, one should practice. And uh, this is the, the build up. At least the 11th chapter is built up to this. And actually, all the preceding chapters on bhakti from 7, 8, 9, 10, especially. 10, 11, they have all built up to this. And this is the seed of the 12th chapter. The 12th chapter is basically an explanation, the next chapter which will come, which is called Bhakti Yoga, the yoga of love, the yoga of devotion. That is an explanation of this, this verse. So this verse is crucial. 55th verse. Mat karma kret mat paramo Mat karma kret mat paramo Mad bhakta sangha varjitaha Mad bhakta sangha varjitaha Nirvaira sarva bhuteshu Nirvaira sarva bhuteshu Yasa mameti pandava Yasa mameti pandava so, O Pandava, he who works for me, has me as the supreme goal, is devoted to me and non-attached and bears no hatred towards any creature, he attains to me. So here, that one-pointed devotion, the practice which Krishna is, is teaching Arjuna, has five components. Five components. Mat Karmakrit, work for me. We'll take up each one separately. Mat Karmakrit, work for me. Then he says, Mat Paramo, have me, have God realization as your supreme goal. You, I am the supreme end for you. The final end, the point of it all for you. That's second. Third, he says, Mat Bhakta, be devoted to me. Love God, devotion to God. Then two things not to do. Three things to do. Two things not to do. One is attachment to the world. Sangha. He says, Sangha Varjita. Give up attachment. Sarva Bhuteshu. To all beings, give up attachment. And the reverse of that. One might say, Oh, I am not attached to anybody. I just basically hate everybody. <laughs> no. The opposite of the Nirvaira. Have no hatred, no dislike for anybody. Sarva Bhuteshu. Both. No attachment. No hatred or dislike for anybody. What will happen then? Mameti, you will attain to me. What is this attaining to me? All aspects. You will realize God that you know you will realize everything is Brahman. You will realize that. Second, you will experience it. See. And third, you will come to me, you will become one with me. So what was what was mentioned earlier? Gyatum, Drashtum, Praveshtum. All three. You will realize God, you will see God, and you will become forever one with God. That moksha, you will attain this. You will be free of samsara. That will happen. That's the result. Practice and the result have both been mentioned here. Now let's take it up one by one. Mat karma krit. You will work for me. One sadhu explained it, I remember. Aap kiske liye kaam karte ho? Whom do you work for? Many people say, I work for my boss. I work for my family. I work for my kids. Or um, uh, I work for my parents. Or you know, or I work for myself. No, no, no. Whom do you work for? So work alone for the Lord alone. Krishna is saying, everything that we do, you just do it. Inner attitude has to be changed. You work. But work for, Krishna says, work for me. That attitude, inner, it's an inner change in inner attitude. Now, what is this work? 
two kinds. First step is two kinds. One is what is obviously you are doing for the Lord. So the prayer that we do, the meditation that we do, the mantras that we re repeat, the rituals that we do in the temple, in the church, and wherever. The kirtan, the singing, ecstatic singing and dancing that we do. All things, the, the holy pilgrimages that we undertake. If you're a Hindu, the dip in the holy rivers that you do. All of this, everything associated with God is automatically, which already is associated with God. Remember, you're doing it for me. That's one. The other side of it, everything that is secular, the job that you do in, the, in your office or school or wherever, the work that you're doing at, at home, even the personal stuff that we are doing for our own maintenance, whether it is walking, talking, eating, all of that is also done for God. So all the sacred work that we do and all the secular activities that we do, all the, the attitude has to change. I am doing it for the Lord. Thou art my master, I am, thou art my Lord, I am thy servant. So, why would you do this for the Lord? What does the Lord gain out of it? This is for Preeti, Bhagavat Preeti Artham. The Lord will be pleased. My beloved will be pleased. That's why I'm doing it. And then next step will be to understand there is no real distinction between these two. This distinction of you know, one is secular work and the sacred work. As we change the attitude, we'll begin to see all of it is sacred. All of it is sacred. Even the so-called secular work is sacred. I remember one monk told me, uh, when I was a novice in the ashram, I said, it's good that we do all this work. We had a big school there. But you know, I really feel purified, sublime when I'm in the temple. But not so much when I'm in the school. And this monk told me, he said, oh really? But you know, I, whether I'm in the temple meditating or sitting in, at my desk and writing a letter, in those days you actually wrote letters. And writing a letter, uh, I feel it's exactly the same. So I thought he was making up, you know, teaching me a principle of karma yoga. But it didn't take me long to understand that he really meant it. It is a holy action, whatever action that you do. You can do it in that spirit. Another example was a monk in the same ashram who was known for his long hours of meditation. Now, the interesting thing I still remember, I was a novice. This monk who was known for his long hours of meditation, one day, the work that he was doing, it was that hours were changed. In the evening, which are his hours of meditation, he was given this work, the duty of supervising the study of the children. The children were studying at that time and usually the monks would meditate at that time, except those monks who had the duty of so uh, we wondered how he would take it because those were the times very very sincerely he would sit and meditate and it's not so easy to have prolonged meditation when you when you're ma made to do that i remember um, I, I can be quite frank in the, uh, in my early days of training at the main monastery so you get up at 3:40 a.m. and then from 4 o'clock you meditate so it was a struggle because uh, it used to be hot and humid even at 4 o'clock in the morning and then you have to have a constant battle with the mosquitoes and so on. And, and meditation was difficult. So when my work was changed from meditation for a short while, I was given the work of cleaning a temple. I was actually happy. <laughs> it was, I felt I was doing something more productive and more... Uh, so meditation is difficult. Scrubbing the floor of a temple at 4 a.m. in the morning is actually easier. <laughs> now, this monk who was good at, and he really enjoyed his meditation, his deep meditation, he was told not to meditate and actually go and work in the school at that time. One day he was walking with me in the evening and he said to me, You know Vishwarup Maharaj, that was, uh, I was called that at that time. Vishwarup Maharaj, I, I got this feeling today that the same peace and serenity that I experienced in meditation, when I was, you know, serving God in the form of those little children and doing the work of the supervision, I had the same experience. 
that impressed me. I thought, I didn't know whether it was real. It's, um, I thought it was quite amazing, but it's not really. It, that realization one must come to. I work for the Lord. So Swami, you can do that. You're running an ashram, but we have a job and you don't know my boss. He thinks he's the Lord, but... <laughs> No, um, we can all do that and we must. Remember, whom is he telling? Krishna is saying this to Arjuna, who is a warrior, a general in an army in the midst of the worst possible human endeavor, which is war. If he can practice it in that circumstance, we have no excuse. We can practice in whatever circumstance, in the worst of circumstances. We work for the Lord. This monk... Um, I didn't meet him, but I read about it. He had said, a senior monk who had worked very hard all his life and now he was old and sick and he was in this place where old, um, like ill monks who are ill, unable to work anymore, they are kept there and they are taken care of. Now, he said this. It's so touching. When somebody asked him how he is doing, he, said, he was always full of, he was, very, he was a deeply satisfied person. Somebody asked him how he's so satisfied. He said this. It's worth uh, remembering. He said, There is a joy in being chosen. A joy in being used. A joy in being broken and set aside. So the Lord has chosen. What great joy. What a great privilege. And the Lord has used me for his work all my life. And now I'm old and sick. Broken. And the Lord has set me aside. An instrument which has you know, been used. There's a, great, there's a great fulfillment here. There's a great fulfillment. And we should all be able to say that. Don't say, but I'm not doing the Lord's work. You are. It's a delusion thinking that we are doing our work. Start by doing the Lord's work in an ashram, in your shrine, in your meditation, that part of it. And then spiritualize your so-called secular, not Lord's work. Very soon you will feel all of it is the Lord's work. Further, all our capacities, whatever we do with the body, whatever we do to the senses. Senses means what we see, we hear, we smell, we taste, we touch. With our motor organs we walk. We grasp, we eat, we speak. All of this can be done to the Lord and it must be. Mat karma krit. Every activity that you do, these powers, these capacities, these energies have been given by the Lord. They belong to the Lord. Or by these capacities, energies, senses, body which have been given by the Lord, I worship the Lord, I do the Lord's work. Eating. You eat, imagine, you're feeding the Lord. So, oh yeah, I am the Lord. No, the Lord inside, in the form of hunger, you're offering the sacrifice there. Sound, coming into the ears. This is a sacrifice into the, um, the, the, the fire of consciousness within, where you're pouring in sound and form. It's all a worship of the Lord going on. The senses are being used to worship the Lord. The hands and the feet. Walking, where are you going? I'm going to the temple of the Lord. Swami, I'm not going to, I'm going to Costco. <laughs> that is the temple of the Lord. They may not know it. But they are blessed. All those angels at Costco. <laughs> yes. Go with that, that inner attitude. By the way, all of this is an inner attitude, a transformation. It's a visualization or a feeling. Don't advertise it. <laughs> so the inner attitude is, wherever I'm going, that is the temple of the Lord. Whatever work I'm doing with the hands, that's the ritual, the puja which I'm performing. Whether it's you're cooking or cleaning or you know working on an assignment or whatever it is. It is, it is the worship of the Lord. So in all these ways, mat karma krit. As that monk said, kiske liye kaam karte hain aap? For whom do you work? Who's your employer? <laughs> I work for the Lord. I work for none else. I've seen this so many times. This was the attitude of Hanuman. 
So in Hanuman, there's a Hanuman Chalisa which is very popular in the north of India. And uh, one of the lines is Rama Kaja Karive Ko Atu Atura. Hanuman, who is uh, Hanuman? Um, it was an ocean of knowledge and power and strength and vigor. And ever eager to, the, to do the, Lord, the Lord's work, the work of Lord Rama. That's the attitude. How can I do the work of, of the Lord? Three questions. Why, how and what? I heard this actually. If you won't believe it, but I heard it first. It is a talk about, it was given, a talk given about the philosophy behind Apple, the company. <laughs> so a short TED talk. I think it was a TED talk. A few minutes only. And this uh, executive uh, presenter, I think, I think either he was an Apple guy or he was a, a management consultant or somebody. He said that it's like this. He put three circles. Concentric circles. The innermost circle was why. The middle circle was how. And the outermost circle was what. So this is, this, this is, he says, very important in organizational life and more so in our personal life. Most companies are about what they do. So IBM produces computers or something like that. You know, and in those days there was a computer, Hewlett Packard and all that. They did. What do they do? They produce computers. We all... But he says, we never thought in that way. We start with the why. Why do you do anything at all? And he says, for us, it is this idea of excellence, elegance, a certain f design philosophy, which has become identified with Apple. And then how do you do it? He says, we do it through a variety of products. We will design such things. And what do you do? Well, we make um, um, iPads and um, MacBooks and things like that. So that what is the final product? But he's right. You will notice in all the uh, Apple products, there is an inner, there is a commonality in all of what, what they do. And the commonality comes from the why. A philosophy which answers your why. Once you have a why, the what will follow by itself. How and what will follow by itself? Why? Why are we at all doing this? Bhagavad Preeti Artham to, pre to please my beloved. Why? To please my beloved. How? With all that he has given me. With this body, with this mind, with these senses, with this field of work, with these people in all around me. This is how. And what? I will, what work will I do? The work the Lord has given me in so many scriptures. What does he want me to do? How does he want me to speak? What does he want me? How does he want me to behave? This is the what. The work that, he, that I have to do. The kindness, the self-sacrifice, the, the uh, ethical upright, uprightness. In the scriptures across the world, the Lord has made it amply clear what the Lord would, how the Lord would want us to be and how he would not want us to be. So the why, the how and the what. So this is mat karma krit. Work for me. And it's an entirely inner shift. Go on doing what you are doing. But the inner shift. It will immediately have an effect. Then he says, mat paramo. Um, consider me as the supreme goal. What is the point of this life? What are you here for? What are we here for? For God-realization. And what that God-realization ultimately looks like is what Vedanta says, Vasudeva Sarvamiti, everything is Brahman. I am that Brahman. The Brahman is the only reality that exists. The divinity is the only reality that exists to realize that. So that is the uh, goal of my life. That is the purpose of my life. That is the end, the meaning of things, the point of it all. Unless there is, a, there is a transcendent point of it all, meaning of it all, then this, uh, you will never be satisfied. Nothing here will be enough. But all of this here in this life is meant for enlightenment, God realization. Then it makes sense. And that is the inner meaning of all the spiritual traditions across the world religions. Different language, different philosophy, different theology. This is common. If we want a truly meaningful life, 
some a source of meaning that will is inexhaustible which will last you till the, till our last days our last hours and beyond that also nothing else will nothing else will follow us but this this ultimate transcendent goal moksha mukti nirvana god realization enlightenment i have often mentioned this that uh, uh, mahatma gandhi i really like that he he was uh, he writes in his biography autobiography that um, um when people ask me who am i some people say that i am a freedom fighter fighting for the free- freedom of india from the british some people say that i am a politician some people say i am a social reformer which is all true actually but if you ask me i am a simple man in search of god how do you see yourself gandhi he says i am a simple man in search of god and we should all be able to say that genuinely you know that's too big for me not big for big for me we are human beings sri ramakrishna says the goal of human life is god realization so the goal of our life is god realization the sooner we acknowledge it and pursue it internally so it doesn't require any external shift not much external shift will happen a huge way <laughs> life will change but internal shift first what am i about what's my the point of my life is it money is it uh, uh, wealth uh, is it success is it facebook likes what is it another meaning of mat paramo means what is um, as one sadhu put it kiska sahara lete hain aap what is your uh, what is your um, support what is your refuge what is your ultimate refuge most people take refuge in what gives you strength solace what do you fall back upon oh the money that i have accumulated or my spouse or my parents or my children or you know the people in my political party or my army or whatever it is no the ultimate support the ultimate refuge must be god not anything in this world what do i turn to when i am most pressed when i am unhappy ma sharada would say often he said if you have nobody else in the world know this for sure even if you have nobody else in the world you have a mother she said i am there for you she herself is a very interesting thing when even her husband sri ramakrishna turned his back to her <laughs> he she had traveled with great difficulty she had heard that her husband had gone mad he's the mad priest of dakshineshwar so she wanted to see for herself the other girls in the village would pity her you know that oh poor uh, sharada she's been married to this mad uh, madman so she wanted to go and see for herself and with great difficulty she in those days was difficult you had to go by bullock cart and cross a river and things like that finally she landed up and uh, she was given a cold reception because sri ramakrishna was being taken care of by his nephew ridai ram who immediately became jealous of her and said why have you come here and sri ramakrishna also didn't really take her side and so she had to go back having come all that way she didn't complain she did complain but not to sri ramakrishna not to ridai not to her parents she went straight to the kali temple in dakshineshwar and she said mother uh, i have come but i have to go back now again when it is your will i will come so whose support do you take whom do you turn to turn to god turn to god mat paramo There's another story which I like very much. Is I read a, it's amusing. I read a few. I think last year probably. It's in the life of Swami Shivananda, the, one of the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, he was the second president of our order. So when he was the president of our order, this was in 1920s in uh, Belur Math in the monastery up uh, on the Ganga opposite Calcutta. In those days, Mahatma Gandhi was. uh fighting against the british you know agitating for indian independence i think it was a non cooperation movement the early 1920s now this elderly gentleman would visit swami shivananda and he would say to swami shiva he was one day he was saying to swami shivananda look all all this trouble that gandhi ji is kicking up 
he is um, you know ruining the lives of these young men they they are giving up their college studies and job prospects and joining his political agitation against the british how silly are the british going to go away just because you hold some marches and demonstrations so swami shivananda didn't say anything he is kept on saying yes 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 the next day again the gentleman had come and a young man had come to become a monk so that young man bowed down to swami shivananda who gave him his blessings and sent him to the monk's quarters arranged for his stay and training and all of that this gentleman was quite indignant the moment the young man left the room the gentleman said is this right when gandhi ji is fighting for the independence of the country this person is turning his back upon the <laughs> his society needs him his nation needs him and he just wants to become a monk is this right the <laughs> swami shivananda said this young man has given up all worldly desires and he wants to realize god and he will practice meditation prayer and service and he will attain peace gandhi ji in all his daily activities you know in all in the midst of his great projects in you know political agitation and everything i am sure he has peace the only person i find who has no peace is you <laughs> is you <laughs> have this high lofty goal god realization is my goal it's not a big claim my civilization tells me the whole idea of purushartha goal of human life dharmartha kama moksha pleasure and wealth and success yes within the limits of dharma but the ultimate goal is moksha liberation god realization enlightenment for whom for everybody when you feel ready yes good that's the meaning of life that's what gives transcendent meaning to life swami ashokan ji again i mentioned this swami ashokan ji in uh, san francisco Uh, 1950s or 60s the cold war had just gotten up the ground and it was like really uh, intense in those days um he said this clash between two ideas of society the capitalist society here and what the ussr is talking about the communist society even if one or the other or both succeed what will you get there is no uh, no transcendent nothing beyond this life whereas he says now i see more and more wisdom in the ancient indian idea of having moksha spiritual liberation as the goal for humanity mm-hmm. even if you he says even in india if you find and these days it's even more true you find people are materialistic they are not really spiritual they are not trying to get enlightenment i think it was the rabbi who came the week before last who said that people go off backpacking to india to find spirituality and uh, then they go there and they become surprised that most people most indians are not living in ashrams <laughs> <laughs> even if most people are n- not at all spiritual they are all pursuing material goals just in the background in your civilization if the idea is there god is real god can be realized and that is the ultimate goal and if that is highly respected in your uh, civilization that's a great blessing to have that that opportunity the ideal the opportunity and the ideal mat parama make me your transcendent goal the goal of your life the purpose of your life the meaning of your life and your resort your refuge your support mat bhakta devoted to me vivekananda said the renunciation is the turning point in spiritual life what does the bhakti yogi do takes all these 100 different kinds of desires worldly desires i want i want i want takes them all and turns them towards god into one almighty love of god feel always that i have none here except thou my lord you alone belong to me and i belong to you and not to anybody else you are mine and i am yours saint teresa of avila she always would sign teresa of jesus that story is there very touching story that once in intense prayer suddenly she had a vision of um, of this luminous bearded figure of course jesus christ and uh, um he he asks her who are you and she immediately says i am teresa of jesus who are you and he replies i am jesus of teresa <laughs> so that's why sister divedita would always write Nivedita of Ramakrishna Vivekananda she would write
I went to her, uh, the, the grave, the cemetery in her father's church in England, uh, where her ashes are interred. There's a crypt. And below that is written, you know who, who took the ashes there? The great uh, scientist Jagadish Bosu, Jagadish Bosu, he took it to England from India because she passed away in, England, in India, in Darjeeling. She to, he took her ashes to England to that little village in Devonshire, a little village, and found out the church and the family crypt and put the ashes there and it's inscribed there. Here lies uh, Nivedita of Ramakrishna Vivekananda. It's written there. Um, I belong to thee, my Lord, and you belong to me. When we do that, I am yours and you are mine. This sense of mindness, this leads to love. We love what is ours. What is ours? God is ours. Then the real, real love for God increases. We, we complain that, we, I know I don't really feel the love for God. How can I get the feeling of love for God? Generate the feeling of God is mine. One way God becomes mine is when the human form is appealing. That's why this cosmic form, the mind-blowing though it might be, uh, it, it creates a gulf, a distance, a fear. So Sri Ramakrishna would always say that the human form makes it closer. The less magnificent it is, the more human it is. So Krishna is closer to Arjuna. Krishna is even closer to Yashoda who regards Krishna as a child, a baby. So God as your baby. God as my father or mother. Sri Ramakrishna regarded God as my mother. Uh, that's very close. You're close to your mother. But God is my baby. The mother is even more close to the baby. So God is your baby. So that's the idea of the child Krishna Gopala, the child Rama, uh, the child Jesus, baby Jesus. That's the idea. That's why, uh, so that way we can humanize the divine and then establish a, divine, a human relationship with the divine. That is Mad Bhakta. Generate deep, intense, loving relationship with God. That's where the Ishta Devata is very helpful. The deity, the chosen form of the deity given by your Guru and the mantra. Then you can establish a personal relation. You know that the deity is the same as Saguna Brahman, Ishwara, which is the same Brahman, which is a cosmic form and all of that. But in that form, Hanuman says, Shri Nate Janaki Nate Abheda Paramatmani Tathapi Mama Sarvasva Sri Rama Kamala Lochana Shri Nata, Vishnu, the Lord of uh, Shri, Janaki Nata, the husband of, uh, of Sita, Ramachandra. I know they are one. They are one indivisible consciousness. Aveda Paramatmani. Tathapi, but, yet. Hanuman says, yet. For me, everything is the lotus eye drama. The lotus eye drama is everything for me. So that's, that's love speaking. The first line was philosophy. I know that it's one divinity. But love is in this form. I love God. Mad Bhakta. Then two things. Sangha Varjita Nirvairasan. No attachment. My, when the attachment is to the Lord, then the attachment to the world goes away. See, attachment is of the form of attachment, mindness and desire. Kamana, Mamata, Asakti. Attachment, attachment is the stickiness with the world. We are not equally detached from everything in the world. To some places, some people, some work, some gadgets, some possessions, mine, mine, mine. Swami Virajan used to say, the entire universe along with this body is presented to you at once. So either it is all yours or none of it is. <laughs> if you can think of the entire world as mine, perfectly all right. Or you can think of nothing here is mine, perfectly all right, same thing. But we make a division. This body is I. And everything outside this is not me. These are the things related to this body which are mine. Other things are not mine. Things, people, places and all of that. So detachment. One monk, very revered. He was my mentor in my early years as a monk. So when he was transferred from the ashram where I joined the order to some other responsibility. When he was leaving that ashram after 18 years, he was so detached. After 18 years of hard work and commitment in that ashram, he left just like that. 
I mean, all the employees, the teachers and all everybody in the ashram, they came to see him off and came to the office where he used to sit for 18 years, gave him farewell gifts and everything, and which he all accepted with smiles and he talked so sweetly to everybody, he had a kind word for everybody. But I noticed one thing, that evening, the next day he would leave the ashram. That evening when he went to his room, all those gifts remained in that office. He didn't take one thing with him. A complete detachment. Um, I asked him once, what is your spiritual practice? He says, asanga, detachment. Non-attachment is my spiritual practice. Non-stickiness. <laughs> that is one. How do you achieve that? By stickiness with God. Yeah. Attach yourself to God, detachment from the world will come by itself. Detachment, if you try to struggle with the world, I'm going to be detached from all of you. <laughs> People will think you're nuts and it will lead to depression, alienation. Yeah. You just behave the way you have been behaving with everybody else. And you love everybody but not individually in the human sense, in the sense of God in everybody. You're loving God in every being. And that's a truer way of relating to people rather than to relate at, with them at the human level. What are these people? Are they bodies? No. More than that. Are they persons? No. More than that. They're nothing but God. Wearing various masks. In fact, the word person means mask. Persona. Sona means sound. Through which sound used to come? The Greek actors, when they would play their parts, they would have these big masks of the characters with holes in them, so where they could shout out their lines in the amphitheater. So that's where the name came. Persona. From which personality has come. It means a mask. But a mask of what? What is the real face behind the mask? It's the face of God. Nirvaira Sarva Bhuteshu. Have nothing against anybody. One of the greatest teachings in the New Testament, in the Bible, is that when you come to offer something before God, if you have if you have ought against your brother, if you have anything, if you hold anything, any grudge, any complaint, any fight, any wrong that you have done to the other or any wrong that has been done to you which you hold as a complaint or a grudge, just leave the offerings where they are. Go and settle matters with your brother and then come back and offer. Otherwise I will not accept. Anybody who practices meditation, you will notice that if you are angry, if you are resentful, at the time of meditation, that's the first thing that will bubble up. It will boil up. It will it'll, uh, throw you off your meditation. Vivekananda said, it is the fool who cannot get angry. The wise person does not. Anger is a fire. Anger is a fire which will burn the place where it is lit first. I want to burn somebody else with my anger, but I am lighting it in my own heart first. It will burn that heart first. The wise person does not get angry. Nirvaira. Nirvaira means without enemy. Be that person without any enemies. So, but I try my best. Other people are nasty to me or they dislike me. That's their business. But as far as you are concerned, you are not against anybody. Nor do you hold any grudge, any ill will, any ill feeling towards anybody. It's not easy. But you have to let go. You have to let go of those things. Such a person, one who does these five practices, work for me, consider me your ultimate goal, point, purpose in life, the why of everything. And then um, be devoted, direct your emotions to me. And then avoid emotional entanglement with the world, which comes in two forms, attachment and uh, you know, uh, aversion. Sangha, attachment, stickiness with the world, with people. No. Another example, I've heard this myself. In our ashram in Deoghar, there's a magnificent temple. So an, a very senior teacher there, a school schoolmaster, he told me, you know when this temple was inaugurated in the 1970s, um, there was a great Swami at that time who worked very, very hard for the temple. It's a poor area to collect money there and set up a big temple. There was no easy thing. So many years he worked hard and the temple came up and the day came for the inauguration of the temple, the establishment of the deity and all of that. It's a big elaborate uh, ceremony. And the president of the whole order, 
Swami Vireshwaranand Ji, who was the 10th president of our order. He had come, many monks had come, thousands of devotees had gathered from all over. And he said that little, it is a little city, it's grown much bigger now, but in those days. So people around had never seen such celebrations. It went on for a whole week. Now, the first day uh, when the celebrations were going on, there was the ritualistic worship and kirtan, ecstatic singing and dancing in the temple, in the front of the picture of Sri Ramakrishna, the newly installed picture of Sri Ramakrishna. And puja was going on. The president of the order was sitting and the Swami who had done all of this, sort of, he had arranged it all. He was dancing in ecstasy there in front and surrounded by other devotees and monks. And then... Um, it was noticed that the president of the order, who was elderly, who was sitting at a distance, he motioned to somebody. And somebody went and told, told the Swami that the president is calling you. So, but not many people noticed what was going on. This Swami went and bowed down to the president in the temple, in the midst of so many people, leaned forward, and the president whispered something to in his ears, and then sat quietly. That night, this gentleman, um, who was a schoolmaster, he said, I was a young schoolmaster in those days, 1970s. And the Swami, the head of our ashram, at night after the day's festivities were over, we were sitting um, late in the night on a wooden bench and that, um, the Swami told me, you know, did you notice this morning when in the midst of all the, the celebrations, I went, the President Maharaj called me and I went there and he whispered something to me. Yes, Swami, we noticed that. What, what was that? He said, he said to me, just these few words, once this is over, come to Belurmat, your time here is finished. This is all this work that you did. He noticed the, the, the taking of the credit for the work and the attachment to this, all of it good. Just half a sentence, it's finished. Uh, seven days of celebrations, next pack up and come. Detachment, complete detachment. It is done for the Lord. It's not yours. And that way you are also free of it all. You're completely free of it all. I remember this uh, story of a Chinese uh, a Zen master, um, a Ch Chan master in those days. A very uh, old story. Who had passed. Um, and his friend hurried to attend his funeral. And the funeral ceremonies were going on. So the friend of that Chinese meditation master who had passed, who was himself a meditation master. He had come and he saw the funeral ceremonies going on and hundreds, thousands of people mourning, weeping. And he let out a great cry and he turned his back and he started walking away. And this, others rushed up to him and said, your friend has passed and you, you, wouldn't you want to stay? You have come after a long journey. What happened? He said, he has passed. But alas, I see he has left so many bound left so many bound to him, you know, bound by cords of love. <laughs> so even that's, that which seems to be so good, there's also attachment. Sangavarjita, detachment. And I have nothing against anybody, Nirvaita, five, five practices. Good. This itself is the essence of Bhakti Yoga and it will be expounded in the twelfth chapter, the chapter which is going to come. Before I end, let me do the Peace chant. Iti Srimad Bhagavad Gita Yaha Shri. Oh no, sorry, this is a Sridhar Swami. This is the um, Vishwarupa Darshana Nama Ekadashwadhyaya. Next will be Dwadashadhyaya Bhakti Yoga. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu We've really gone beyond time so uh, I don't, uh, we won't have a Q&A now. But this subject will continue in the next several classes with the 12th chapter. 12th chapter is very short but it's very important. It's a teaching on bhakti. Then the transition back to the way of knowledge will come again in 13th chapter.